This is PT Pro Talk, the podcast for physical therapists who want to improve their clinical skills and be more successful. I'm Mariana Parks, physical therapist and your host. And today I interview Dr. Lynn McInnes to discuss radiology clinical decision rules focusing on cervical spine injury. We will cover the Canadian Cervical Spine Rule, CCR, and the National Emergency X Radiography Utilization Study Nexus. We will apply the CCR in a patient case of cervical fracture with posterior ligament injury while skydiving. Dr. McInnes is a physical therapist with over 40 years of experience, and she authored the Fundamentals of Musculoskeletal Imaging, the first imaging textbook written for physical therapists by a physical therapist. It is currently in its fourth edition, translated into several languages, and is used by the majority of DPT US curriculum. If this sounds interesting to you, please subscribe to our channel, hit the notification bell for updates, give us a thumbs up, share with other clinicians who could benefit from our conversation. Thank you for tuning in, and we hope you enjoy the show. PT Pro Talk is only possible with the support of the forward-looking and innovative companies like Systems for PT, the do anything, anytime EMR. Systems for PT develops systems for clinics so you can focus on your patients. Go to systemsforpt.com to schedule a demo today. Looking for the highest quality equipment for your clinic? Turn to Fitter First. Our wobble, rocker, and slant boards are all assembled in North America to meet the demands of a busy professional clinic. Designed to adjust in seconds and made from the highest quality materials. Get the best Canadian-made rehab and balance products for your clinic. Order online for your clinic or for your clients. Ground shipping anywhere in North America. Visit fitter1.com. That's F-I-T-T-E-R, the numeral one, dot com. Remote therapeutic monitoring sounds great, but also difficult. Sara Health makes RTM simple and easy for your patients and providers. Check out sarahealth.com to learn more. Hi, Lane. Welcome to PT Pro Talk. How are you today? Fine. I'm happy to be here. Good morning. Good morning. And let's get started talking a little bit about yourself and your career for the ones that don't know you. Uh, sure. I've been a physical therapist for 43 years. Um, I, I can't get over that. I've been working continuously the whole 43 years, and I've been very lucky. I've always kept um, my clinical um, life uh, divided between teaching, writing, and, and seeing patients. So I think I'm very fortunate that I was able to do that. And I'm still seeing patients. I work in home care for our visiting nurses agency here in my hometown. I'm still in my hometown of Butler, Pennsylvania. That's amazing. 43 years. That's impressive. And that you're still practicing as a PT. I think that's amazing. It's been fun to see the whole arc of our profession change, and um, it, I just I love our profession, and I, I like where it's going. And so you are still teaching as well? Yes. Yep. So this is one of the topics I, I like to teach on is um, how to use imaging. That's my, my field of um a bit of expertise, at least for the fundamentals. I can claim expertise in the fundamentals. Is we all know the field of imaging is growing by leaps and bounds and getting more interesting every day. But the average therapist, I think, really needs to understand the fundamentals so that they can make good patient choices. Um, oftentimes, we're in positions of being first contact uh, clinicians. And also, no, there are many physical therapists working in emergency departments. So that's an interesting specialty in itself. But right now, it just seems like yeah, imaging, especially radiology, is just something that's in our wheelhouse, and we should be pretty comfortable with it, although not everybody is. So I kind of think it's worth reviewing some of the fundamentals. So today, I wanted to talk about clinical decision instruments. So um, we know these exist in every field of medicine. You know, we have them in cardiology, um, but in general, a clinical decision instrument is a validated tool, and it's designed to help us clinicians determine either a diagnosis or a prognosis and then guide the course of action. 
So we call them clinical because we gain the information solely from our physical observation or examination of the patient. And again, the great thing about being a physical therapist is of all the professionals they're going to see, we are the ones who have the most time with the patient. So we have time to get um, those observations um, completed and and be comprehensive in our examinations. So um, I kind of went down a tangent um, for one of my um, editions of the textbook to understand clinical decision instruments as a whole, because we call them um, in different lingos. So we can divide them into clinical prediction rules, and those are the rules which stratify risk, or clinical decision rules which direct a decision. And anything that helps us direct a decision is a good thing. So for example, the the two most common clinical prediction rules that therapists learn, students learn uh, in healthcare are the WELLS criteria to predict the probability of a patient having a deep vein thrombosis. And the other one we use all the time, it's it's embedded into most of our uh, EMR assessment tools is the Braden scale. And that predicts the probability of a patient developing a pressure ulcer. So both of these clinical prediction rules use a number score to identify if the patient is low, medium, or high risk, right? Mm -hmm. Now, on the other hand, the clinical decision rule incorporates three or more variables from the history or the physical exam that will direct a decision. And in the field of emergency medicine, there's five clinical prediction rules regarding radiographs. And again, because us as physical therapists have the potential to be first contact providers, we need to be able to apply these rules correctly. Mm-hmm. So what's nice is each, there's, there's five rules uh, regarding uh, emergency medicine, um, uh, first contact um, decisions on radiology, but the rules are very Clear. They're they're very binary. They answer the question: Does this patient need radiographs or not? And sometimes, even if we're not working in the emergency department or not a first contact, uh, these rules are going to come in handy because we've all uh, experienced stories where uh, initial correct diagnoses were missed or incorrectly diagnosed. Um, so these these basic rules come in valuable. So here's the five clinical decision rules about radiography that exist. So we have two about the neck, two about the knee, and one about the ankles. So for the neck, we have the Canadian cervical spine rule and the nexus or the National Emergency X-ray Utilization Study, which everyone just calls nexus. Uh, For the knees, we have um, the Ottawa knee rules and the Pittsburgh knee rules. And then for the ankle, we have the Ottawa ankle rules. But today I wanted to focus on the two um, cervical spine rules. Um, They are um, really, I guess, most important. I like to go over them um, to all students and uh, go over them a lot in all my fundamental um, imaging courses because If you miss a serious injury in the cervical spine, it can have dire consequences. So they're they're good to um, teach, and they're great for us as experienced clinicians just to uh, revisit. So any questions so far? (laughs) I I do have one. How about the other body parts? They don't have rules. (laughs) Oh, good question. So why do we have rules for just these? Three joints, right? Neck, yes. knee, and ankle. Well, these are the joints that are injured with the greatest statistical frequency. Um, however, of all these joints then injured with the greatest frequency coming into the emergency department, only a very small percentage of these joints will actually have fractures, which need to be identified by radiology. So when you take the time and the effort and the research to make up a clinical decision rule, you are pulling from a great uh, body of literature. And of course, these are the joints that are written about the most and the most studies are done on. So that's why they exist for these three areas of the body. Okay. Okay. 
And in general, it would be easy to radiograph every joint injury that comes into the emergency department. So when you think about it, individually, radiographs aren't that expensive. But if you radiographed all the millions of ankle, knee, and neck sprains that typically come to any emergency department in a year, you know, only a really small percentage of those patients are going to have a fracture. So the majority of patients um, will have a radiograph without any health benefit. And when you're talking about millions of joints, that really small ticket item of a radiograph will cumulatively use billions of dollars in resources, time, money, and unnecessary radiation exposure. So that's why uh, in the literature, they pick these three joints first, mm -hmm. uh, simply by the numbers. Yeah, it makes so sense. So anyway, the Again, just to review why you have clinical decision rules in radiology is to answer the binary question, does this patient need radiographs or not? So, mm -hmm. okay. okay. So we'll start with uh, Nexus first. Um, again, that, that stands for the, the title of the study, National Emergency X-Radiography Utilization Study. So this was a really large-scale study. It was published in 2000, so 23 years ago, and it validated a set of criteria suggested by a dozen smaller studies carried out in the 1980s and 90s. So the patient population to apply the nexus criteria to is any patient of any age who has sustained a blunt trauma. And this is a patient complaining of neck pain. Mm -hmm. So blunt trauma, um, and I, I, I teach online and I have a students from all over the globe. And we have to talk about that because sometimes in translation, it, it loses some meaning. Blunt trauma is just an American old radiography medical term, and it simply means um, any trauma from an external force. So typically in the emergency departments, we're talking about motor vehicle accidents or falls. So the opposite of a blunt trauma would be any penetrating trauma, like a stab wound or a gunshot injury. So those patients were excluded from application of the nexus criteria. So mostly we're looking at uh, motor vehicle accidents, bicycle accidents, um, you know, collisions with car and vehicle of any kind, a car and pedestrian or, or falls. So the nexus is um, much easier to apply than the Canadian cervical spine rule because there's just five criteria that a patient has to meet. And if they meet these criteria, they do not need radiographs. So again, remember, we're in an emergency department setting. So the five criteria are there's no posterior midline tenderness of the neck. There's no evidence of intoxication, no altered consciousness no neurologic deficit, and no painful distracting injuries like a broken leg along with the neck sprain. So if all five criteria are met, there's a 99% sensitivity that there is no clinically significant injury in the cervical spine, and so no radiographs are needed. Mm -hmm. So that's not always the patient we're going to see in outpatient, and that's why the Canadian cervical spine rule comes in a little handier for us uh, working in uh, outpatient clinics or other inpatient facilities. So the research for the Canadian C-spine rule was published again, 2001. So we're talking it's 22, 23 years old already. So when they published it, the article was titled the Canadian C-spine rule for radiography in alert and stable trauma patients. And they had C-spine in the title, so that just stuck. So everyone says Canadian C-spine, or they abbreviate it to CCR. And um, if you look at the American College of Radiology's appropriateness criteria, they just call it Nexus and CCR. So both these clinical decision rules are very similar in their inclusion criteria. They, they both apply to patients who have sustained a blunt trauma, and their value is similar. They identify if the cervical spine can be cleared of significant injury and not require radiographs, or if the cervical spine cannot be cleared and require radiographs. So um, the important thing is to know uh, 
who you can include and who we want to exclude. The inclusion criteria for any clinical decision rule um, is, is important so that you apply it correctly. So for the C-spine rule, it has to be a trauma patient and they stratify the age older than 16, alert with a Glasgow comma scale score of 15, that's perfect, and with stable vitals. So the exclusion criteria, just meaning that the literature they pulled this from, I'm sorry, the cohort they pulled this from, do not have anybody in it younger than 16. If you had a Glasgow coma score less than 15, if there were other uh, injuries, abnormal vitals, or if the injury was more than 48 hours ago. Um, and then they went on and on to be really specific. No penetrating trauma, no acute paralysis, no pre-existing known vertebral disease. So it, it's nice to mention that, that there are rules to this. But I, again, these clinical decision rules, like any rules, apply to the majority of patients. There's always going to be outliers and exceptions. Um, the Canadian cervical spine rule is three questions. And that sounds really nice. But in reality, this rule is kind of unwieldy, and it takes some getting used to. The first question is easy, and usually you can stop right there, <laughs> which is nice. So the first question is, are there any high-risk factors that mandate radiography, including the patients older than 65, they had a dangerous mechanism of injury, or has paresthesias in their extremities? So if you had yes to any of those, they get radiographs. So that's really neat. So older than 65, they had a dangerous mechanism of injury or have paresthesias. So this is your, again, patient coming into the emergency department with some type of trauma. And again, what's a dangerous mechanism of injury? What's dangerous to a 20-year-old might not always be dangerous to a 70-year-old. And again, that's why they have the age stratification in there. But it's considered to be um, dangerous if there's a fall from a height of three feet or five steps or an axial load to the head. So think of somebody diving into a swimming pool or any motor vehicle collision at a high speed or collision involving some type of motorized recreational vehicle or a bicycle collision. So we, we get the idea. Anytime there's an, uh, an external force that hurts, <laughs> that's a dangerous mechanism of injury. So those people then are gonna get radiographs. Um, the next question then, is are there any, if the patient looks good, uh, you know, they look low risk, it, are there any low risk factors that allow us for um, performing, having the patient perform safe assessment of range of motion? Because that's typically what we do, right? We talk to the patient first and then we say, let me see you move. We want to see what they're willing and able to do. So you're not going to ask a trauma patient to do that unless they look low risk. So low risk would be, first of all, the mechanism of injury didn't seem that bad. Maybe it was just um, a, 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 they were on a boat and they hit a wave and they got a little uh, whiplash. So again, it depends on the patient. Um, your patient's sitting normally, walking around. There's not a whole lot of neck pain. There's an absence of that midline cervical spine tenderness. If the patient looks like that, then yes, we can safely assess his range of motion and go to the third question. But if the patient doesn't look like any of that, if he doesn't look low risk, he's going to get radiographs. Now, let's say your patient did look fine. They're walking around. They're impatient because they've been waiting for a couple hours in the emergency department. Um, we are going to um, get them x-rays. If they're low risk, we're going to go ahead and let them rotate their neck. And if they can rotate 45 degrees, they don't need x-rays. If they can't rotate 45 degrees, they're going to get x-rays. So, Again, it's a little unwieldy to navigate. It's, it's been a barrier to emergency departments adopting the Canadian cervical spine rule. Um, but again, with the physical therapy assessment, when we have the patient in front of us one-on-one -on -one and we have the time to assess them, 
we can certainly apply this rule. So the takeaway is if there was a trauma and our patient is not getting better with conservative care and the pain level is unrelenting and they're not able to rotate, and that's because the body's protecting itself, you want to refer for additional imaging, even if the initial radiographs were negative. So that's not an uncommon scenario. Um, patients will often have radiographs, I shouldn't say often, um, but we see a lot of cases like this where patients have negative radiographs in the emergency department, um, but there truly is an injury that was not um, discovered. And there, there's multiple reasons for that. Uh, one of the most common errors in uh, radiography in emergency departments is simply not visualizing all seven vertebra, that the radiograph was technically made incorrectly and they missed C7. So we've seen cases in the literature of C7 spinous process fractures, for instance, um, just not on the image. So they couldn't be spoken to because they couldn't be evaluated on that image. There's always the risk that there was a ligamentous injury, but spasm is holding the uh, cervical spine in place, and the ligamentous uh, injury is not evident. And how it would be evident on radiograph is simply because um, of positioning. If you see that fanning between the two vertebra, between the two spinous processes, it's typically from interspinous uh, ligament tearing. But if there's enough spasm and the patient's holding themselves um, in a protective posture, their uh, cervical lordosis may look normal and may look fine. Another reason is just human error. There's always going to be human error in uh, any part of medicine. and We've all had our experiences with that. And sometimes there's error, not just um, a failure to read correctly, and remember, in the middle of the night, it's not always radiologists who are reading the radiographs. Uh, it might be who's ever available, and there'll be a second read by the radiologist on the day shift. So th there might be a lag before you get a pair of expert eyes on that radiograph. That's important to note. And the other thing is um, the most important thing, and my favorite textbook starts with this. The most important thing on any image is that you have the patient's correct name. <laughs> stamped on the corner because, um, and if you work in healthcare, you see about once a week, you see a major mix up of names on charts, right? And usually they're not life-threatening. You, you'll, you'll start to see a list of past procedures and you go, no, this patient definitely doesn't have an amputation that I'm he's sitting here in front of me. <laughs> or this medication list is way out of whack. And you just realize, you know, despite the EMR, it's, you know, the, our, our electrical health record has not minimized human error. We, we've just transferred human error to a more expensive electronic technology. <laughs> so the most important thing is always make sure you're looking at the right image or you're reading the right report. So Yeah, very important detail. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I have a case that just fits the Canadian cervical spine rule so well. And um, one of my um, side jobs is I have the best job in the world. I, I say it's the best book club ever. I get the honor and privilege of being a co-editor for the Journal of Orthopedic and Sports Physical Therapy on the musculoskeletal imaging feature with Kimi Yamada and Mike Rosenthal. So what this feature is is case studies submitted by therapists from all over the globe. We try to keep it at 300 words. So it's a you know, really short, easily digestible read. And it highlights how imaging uh, is a significant part of the physical therapy evaluation or diagnosis or prognosis. And they're just fascinating, really interesting cases. So I like to use them uh, in my assessments when I, when I teach uh, imaging online uh, to let students read everything they can out of this 300-word uh, um, feature case and um, ask as many questions as I can get out of that. And um, it's wonderful because it takes us down tangents of what 
clinical decision rules were used, what ACR appropriateness criteria fit this patient, which variants did they fit. Um, the ACR appropriateness criteria is a, is a whole conversation. It's, it's an amazing um, document that's been around for, oh, I think we're going closer to 30 years now. I used to give a, a pre-conference course on the ACR back in the 90s um, when no one knew what it was because no one was paying attention to it, even radiologists. But it's um, recently become more popular because insurance companies have discovered it and they are requiring any physicians who order any imaging to have um, backup for why this imaging is needed. So the ACR appropriateness criteria is even built into many uh, electrical ordering systems so that the insurance company knows, oh, this MRI is needed or this bone scan is not appropriate for this patient. We're not going to pay for it unless they give us some additional justification. So anyway, it's it's pretty popular now, which is good. It deserves to be. And it's, a, it's an amazing body of work. And the um, most important thing is that it's free to everyone. They've got over 233 topics now, 1,100 variants, and 3,000 clinical scenarios. And they started a new thing. They made 130 patient-friendly clinical summaries. So um, it's certainly readable and accessible to everyone. And most important for physical therapy students and clinicians is when you have a clinical condition and you read through the variants, it almost serves as a clinical decision tree. And again, it, when they make documents like this, they're basing them on a body of evidence of, of literature. And literature is written on things that are, um, you know, the greatest amount anyway, on things that are most common. So these are the patients, you know, with, you're going to see in your practice, because you're going to see the most common clinical conditions. So it's a great teaching tool just to read through it. Um, I have my students do that as a midterm assignment, and they're always dreading it because it's online and then, um, you know, a website that they have to navigate. Um, but then the feedback from the experience is always um, extraordinary. They just can't believe that this is all laid out in front of them. So... Uh, if you haven't had a chance to explore it, um, it's something you owe yourself, whether you're a student or an experienced clinician, it's a valuable body of work. So the case that uh, we're going to talk about was published in, <laughs> I'm going to land the plane now. Now we're going back to JOSP's, JOSPT's musculoskeletal imaging feature. And um, the title is Cervical Fracture with Posterior Ligamentous Injury While Skydiving. And the uh, authors are um, military uh, physicians in the U.S., uh, Warren Flout, Robert Rowland, and Richard Westrick. So just an excellent case. The story starts with a 46-year-old male soldier going to an emergency department with severe neck pain after he was doing some recreational skydiving. And on one of his jumps, he had an unusually rapid parachute opening, which caused him to have a hyperflexion, like a whiplash injury. So in the emergency department, he had radiographs. They were negative for fracture, and he was released with a diagnosis of acute neck strain. So very common, right? That's our bread and butter type of patient. And they get sent to um, his PCP, you know how they always they give some meds and say follow up with your primary care provider. He saw the primary care provider a week later, and the primary care provider referred him to therapy because he was still having severe neck pain. So the physical therapist evaluation finds very exquisite tenderness with light palpation over C5 and C6 spinous process, and the patient is unable to actively rotate his neck more than 45 degrees bilaterally. So that sounds familiar, right? We're hearing yes. that of C-spine. Yep. So the patient had no neurologic symptoms, no radiating pain. Uh, the whole neurologic exam was unremarkable. So we expect this patient to have, at a week out, after serious whiplash-type uh, mechanism, we expect them to have pain. 
but we don't expect them to have pain that's still a 10. It should be getting better, uh, at least going in the right direction. And this pain is not. So the physical therapist um, is able to refer for radiographs, and he does. Um, remember, the first ones were negative, but the therapist applies the Canadian cervical spine rule. When you have severe pain, midline tenderness, and can't rotate 45 degrees, you need radiographs, despite what the first radiographs showed. And of course, uh, that's when everything's revealed. Yeah, he has bilateral fractures of uh, the C6 lamina and uh, the, um, the lateral x-ray. You can see a, a fanning of the spinous process between five and six, which you infer, you don't see directly on a radiograph, but you infer by joint positioning that those ligaments are torn. So um, if you go to the ACR then um, and look, let's see, I'll tell you exactly. If you look at what variant would be next on this decision tree, um, the first variant is always initial imaging indicated by nexus or CCR, and that's what the patient had. That would be variant two under the topic suspected spine trauma. And then um, after the acute cervical spine injury is detected, variant four you would pick would be treatment planning for the mechanically unstable spine. And the, the two imaging studies that are recommended are CT um, and or MRI. And this patient had both of them. And of course, he ended up with um, open reduction and in, uh, internal fixation with um, uh, ligamentous repair. And he did well. And he was back to uh, full deployment in eight months. So the interesting thing about this case was that the physical therapist acted correctly. They referred correctly. And a um, point of uh, maybe disagreement among my colleagues and myself is I don't believe it is critical that therapists read images. What I believe is critical is that they know when to refer. And this uh, physical therapist did exactly the right thing. They did not let the prior imaging report um, bias them and did what was correct. They reordered the radiographs. And that's, you know, you could have gone right to CT, but it's always better to use the most um, least invasive and um, least expensive imaging study first. That's just kind of a general principle. And then, of course, he went to CT and MR as was appropriate as indicated by the radiograph. So that's um, the, the kind of case I love because it teaches us to trust our clinical skills. And no matter how wonderful and um, technical all our tools are getting, nothing replaces looking at the patient, um, observing, palpating. Those are the skills that I think it feels like sometimes we're the only ones left who do that with the patient and um, certainly is what our value is as professionals. A few questions. So we were talking about the ACR and then the clinical rules. So what is the difference? Is ACR considered like a clinical rule? Or um, I've, I've looked at it and they have multiple different areas being musculoskeletal, one of them, right? So like what is that? How does that fit with like a clinical rule? So when you look at the ACR appropriateness criteria, these, these are evidence-based guidelines and they are fluid. They are being reviewed by expert consensus panels and there'll always be a year up in the corner of when it was last reviewed. So again, they started 30 years ago and think how much has changed. Like for instance, with the, with the cervical spine, it was always start with radiographs. Well, now if it's a, um, a serious um, high collision injury, they're going to put the patient right in the CT scanner. So, you know, things are, are updated continuously. We as physical therapists would not be looking at every topic range. We would mostly be in their two topic 
ranges of musculoskeletal and neurological. And back pain or spine trauma ends up being in both of those categories. So again, they are, there's no strict rules there, but when there are clinical decision rules that are validated, they are embedded into the ACR. So usually um, it, it, it's spelled out in the uh, clinical condition um, that you can um, see when you, when you go to that website. Um, so uh, the difference is there, there are guidelines, evidence-based guidelines, and they're fluid. They're, they're changing as we get more information. So um, and again, the, the majority of physical therapists are going, going to be looking at the musculoskeletal topic and the neuro, neurological topic, because even headaches, for instance, are in the neurological side. And, and you know, think how much we treat headaches and how many paths you can go down. You know, is it um, blood flow limitation? Is it postural? Is it vestibular? Um, is it um, TMJ? Uh, so anyway, this is one of the um, areas that is so valuable that uh, the ACR can serve as a teaching tool just to remind you of the scope of uh, the human body and how pain can refer. Um, it, it's uh, something that deserves our, our time to, to poke around in <laughs> and look at. Um, hope that explained it. Yes. And it's so, I don't know if it's correct to say that it's a little more robust and complete, like you have. Um, so I remember I was looking at it and it's saying, if X, Y, and Z happen, you go and you order an X-ray. But then if other situations happen, you're going to go, like you said, and order like a CT scan or something that gives you a little more guidance. I would say that maybe uh, just those the clinic, not just, but the clinical rules are going to tell you if you need or are there an image or not, right? right? And the other ones, I guess, give you more guidance on following up go. with the case. Yes. Exactly. Where to go next. And then yeah. have it be justified because, you know, what we saw when imaging got interesting, when CT and MRI started appearing in every community hospital, what we saw in the 80s was a smorgasbord patient would come to you and they would have had x-rays, MRI, CT, bone scan. It was, wow, let's throw everything at them and see what we can see. Because it took about 10 years for a natural maturation of the imaging study and um, expertise and interpretation to find out uh, what was valuable to illuminate the diagnosis and what was really worthless or what was redundant. So um, over the next two decades, then, um, we saw that gradually disappear. Um, of course, what we see nowadays more often is MRI for everything. And that just speaks to um, the, you know, the utility of this great imaging tool, how many things it, it can see. But CT has also been um, developing also. Um, and again, technology isn't cheap and um, radiation exposure isn't infinite for people. We have to be careful how many bone scans or PET mm -hmm. scans, nuclear imaging, CTs that a patient is exposed to in their lifetime. So there's lots of factors that led to us reining in uh, how much imaging a patient uh, should have in order to altered their outcome. Because the whole point of imaging is to make a decent diagnosis so you can treat them correctly. So you want the least amount of imaging for the best answer. And that's what the ACR um, is, is valuable for. And that's why the insurance companies uh, are so tied into this, because this is evidence. You know, why should we pay for that study? What, you know, what's it going to um, mm -hmm. help with in the in the treatment decisions of this patient and what is extraneous. So uh, th that's a good thing. And it's good that they're basing it on evidence. But again, uh, it, it's a guideline. It just applies to the majority of patients. And the complexity of the human condition is always such that you can't apply hard and fast rules, except for things like a binary question, like a clinical decision rule in radiography 
does this patient need radiographs or not? But like we just saw in this case, um, they did get radiographs in the emergency department, but at evaluation a week later, we see that it didn't fit the clinical picture. So now we had to use our brains to go back and say, oh yeah, now, now we need a radiograph again to complete the diagnostic picture. So we know where to go next in the diagnostic investigation. And in that, going back to that specific case, so you suspect a ligament injury, and then you have to order another type of image exam to just confirm the diagnosis that's that you're talking right. about. Right. Yeah. And that's what the MRI would, would assist in. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I think it's the, those guidelines just help keep providers accountable <laughs> for what they're doing, right? Right. Yes. Very good. Um, Lane, anything else before um, everything that we just talked about? before we transition to the final questions? Um, no, that's, that's all I um, got for you today. <laughs> it was uh, fun talking with you. Awesome. I love your and, podcast. Yay, <laughs> very good. And I wanted to ask a resource of information that you like. I mean, you are a writer other than all your books. <laughs> <laughs> I love uh, JOSPT. I, I love that. And I love our musculoskeletal imaging and cases. It, if you, uh, of course, we're out of print now. I used to love to hold the, the journal in my hands. But if you go online, we actually have a, a division called JOSPT Cases. And that's where our feature is housed with other case reports. And there's you know, nothing more valuable than other people's experiences being well reported. And, um, you know, anecdotally, we can learn a lot as, as much as we can learn by looking at, you know, incredible wells of evidence based literature. Yeah. yeah. And are you still writing more books? Well, we're talking about a sixth edition for the fundamentals of musculoskeletal imaging. Um, I, I don't know if I have it in me. I'm, it might be time to pass it on to your generation. <laughs> Very cool. Um, and any advice to PTs that are starting their careers? Sure. Um, I think my uh, favorite piece of advice is to join your association. If you're in the U.S., please join the APTA simply because um, you have those, you know, district local network meetings, which are wonderful social networking gatherings. Plus, you can find uh, special interest groups there. It can be, um, you know, the average therapist sometimes gets stuck in jobs that are not ideal, but, you know, they, they're stuck there for a while for various reasons. Or maybe they uh, love the work, but they don't like their coworkers. I mean, we know what work life is like. It's sometimes it's a gamble, but you always have the option of meeting like-minded people who want to um, get the best out of their profession. If you join, you know, the APTA in your local district, um, that's just such a support network that people don't think of it that way. Um, it's a professional network, but also. It's, it's a social network to help you find people who um, share your interests and, and understand the stresses. It's a tough time to be in healthcare. And um, the only thing we can do is help each other get through it. So my best advice is uh, join the APTA so you can get to your state and your local um, meetings and um, start to make friends that way that you'll keep your whole career. So. Yeah. And Lynn, if anyone wants to reach out or find find more information about you, your books, how they can find you? Um, you can publish my email. That's fine. I, I'm, okay. I'm easy to find. Do you have any social media? I don't. I, I need to, to hire somebody to hook me up because that's <laughs> outside my wheelhouse. <laughs> I know. A lot of a lot of work, social media. Ling, thank you so much uh, for all the contribution to our profession, and it's an honor to have you here. So I appreciate you and your time and your dedication to the profession and to this day. Oh, thank you, Mariana. You're just lovely, and thank you for doing this for all of us. <laughs> <laughs>